Next on PIJN News, Dr. Chaps reports on these important issues. Angels, demons, fallen angels, lesser gods, and the book of Enoch, and the Nephilim, don't forget. We're gonna introduce Derek Gilbert, who is an Old Testament scholar, to talk about spiritual warfare. Former Navy Chaplain Gordon James Klingenschmidt took a stand to defend religious freedom by daring to pray publicly in Jesus' name. Now he helps you by reporting the news, discerning the spirits, and praying the scriptures. Would you pray with us? Here's Dr. Chaps. God bless you in Jesus' name. My name is Chaplain Gordon James Klingenschmidt, Dr. Chaps, and you're watching PIJN News. On this show, we like to do three things. We report the news, we discern the spirits, and we pray the scriptures in Jesus' name. But today we have a celebrity interview with my new friend, Derek Gilbert, who has written a new book. I'll let him talk about that. But he is joining us live via Skype from somewhere in the Ozarks in Missouri. Welcome to the program, Derek Gilbert. Dr. Chaps, it's an honor to be here. Thank you for having me today. So Derek, it's great to meet you. And tell me about this new book that you wrote. The Great Inception, Satan's PSYOPs from Eden to Armageddon. It um, struck me as my wife and I were doing Bible study about uh, two years ago when we were reading about the, uh, the Red Sea crossing, which is a story all of us have heard since Sunday school. It's a pretty spectacular uh, miracle. Uh, and, but I had never noticed before in Exodus chapter 14, at the beginning of the chapter, God tells Moses to turn back. And so we began to wonder, what was that about? Why did God tell them to turn around when they were getting away? Uh, and gave very specific instructions. Turn back and camp here at a place called Pi. I'm probably going to pronounce this incorrectly. In fact, I know I will. Uh, P. Haharoth, um, in front of a place called Baal Zaphon. Well, scholars will tell you, and by the way, I do not claim to be a scholar, but uh, I, I just have pretty good reading comprehension. Well, I'm going to introduce you as the host of Skywatch TV, which is a, a nationally syndicated TV show about biblical prophecy. So I'm going to correct you a little bit there. I sort of am be introducing you as an Old, Old Testament scholar, but I'll let you be humble. Well, that's I, I, thank you very much. I appreciate it. I am honored. <laughs> Uh, but God, God told them to camp in front of a place called Baal Zaphon, and as I began to research it to figure out why God gave these very specific instructions, um, but the first question is, what was Baal doing in Egypt? Because Baal was a Canaanite deity. I always thought that if you're in Egypt, the Egyptians would be worshiping the Egyptian gods, like you know Ra and Osiris and Horus and so forth. Well, historians know the answer to that question. There was a period of history called the Second Intermediate Period, roughly 1750 B.C. to about 1550 B.C., or the time of Isaac through Joseph, more or less, where northern Egypt or lower Egypt was under the control of Semitic people called the Hyksos. They spoke a language similar to Hebrew. They worshipped the Canaanite deities. They brought their culture, and they brought their gods, of course, and Baal was one of their gods. Well, what was Zaphon then? What is Baal Zaphon? Everyone in the ancient world knew that Mount Zaphon was the holy mountain of Baal. It's 500 miles north of the Nile Delta. It's in Turkey, right on the border with Syria, right on the Syrian coast. And everybody in the ancient world from, uh, from Persia to Greece knew that was the mountain where Baal had his palace. So why put that on the shore of the Red Sea, a site holy to Baal, named for his holy mountain on the shore of the Red Sea? Well, in the Canaanite religion, Baal was the god who mastered the chaos god of the sea, a god called Yam. And so Baal became the uh, patron god of sailors, Canaanite sailors, Phoenician sailors, uh, down to the time of Jesus. So wait, Prayed bring me back to the time Baal. when Moses turned back. Is that related to this area? Because Moses crossed the Red Sea. Exactly, but before they crossed the Red Sea, God said, turn back and camp at a place called Pihaharoth in front of Baal Zephon and face Baal Zephon. <clears throat> They had the, the Israelites camped there facing this place sacred to Baal while the Egyptian cavalry, the chariot uh, corps, caught up to them. Now, the uh, angel in the pillar of fire separated the Egyptians from the Israelites. These Egyptians, remember, now worshiping Baal because they may not have been Egyptian. They may have been these Canaanite people called the Hyksos. The point is God put, them, put Israel right there in front of a place sacred to Baal, named for Baal's holy mountain, on the shore of the Red Sea which was supposed to be Baal's turf because he was the god who had mastered the sea, defeated the chaos god of the sea, tamed the sea, and thus became the patron god of sailors. And then Yahweh, the creator, the god of the Bible, says, you think you 
Baal, are the master of the sea, watch this. And in front of all Israel and all the Pharaoh's army, part of the sea, allowed Israel to cross. Now, just imagine being one of the uh, Egyptian soldiers thinking, well, our God's got this in the bag. This is a trap. He's luring the Israelites in. Oh, wait, they're getting to the other side. And then, of course, wow. the water closed in on the Egyptian army. This was God not just delivering Israel from the hand of Pharaoh, as it says in Scripture. This was God delivering Israel from the hand of Baal. And more than that, sending a message to Baal, one of these small g, rebellious, false gods, whose people were occupying the land that Yahweh had called for, him, for himself, reserved for himself, the land of Canaan. My people are free, and now we are coming for you. So Yahweh is greater than Baal, Yahweh is the true God of the sea, and Yahweh, the God of Moses, delivered the Jewish people from the Egyptian false gods with a lower G. I am so impressed right. with this. Uh, we're gonna take a short break. When we come back, we're gonna ask Derek Gilbert about other lesser gods and the Nephilim and fallen angels. Giving you a megaphone in Washington, D.C. Dr. Chaps will be right back. Let's take a stand with Israel today. Would you sign a petition with me? Visit our website, PrayInJesusName.org. Again, that's PrayInJesusName.org. And sign a petition to defend Israel, who is America's closest ally, certainly in the Middle East, if not in the entire world. We remember watching Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu give that speech at the UN when he warned about the making of an Islamic nuclear bomb, and that is being forged in Iran. But what are we doing now? The USA is negotiating with the Europeans to allow Iran to continue to develop nuclear material. Well, that's not right. Do we really trust this man, Hassan Rouhani, the president of Iran, who is the former nuclear weapons chief? You don't think they're gonna build a nuclear bomb when his predecessor, Mahmoud Ahmadinejad, literally threatened to wipe Israel off the map of history. Now, we need to take a stand. Why is American foreign policy to fund the Muslim Brotherhood? Let's sign a petition to stop that. Stop sending our taxpayer dollars to fund the Muslim Brotherhood. And let's also sign a petition to protect the Jewish homeland. Both of those are available today at our website, PrayInJesusName.org. And when you sign those petitions, we will fax them to Congress. Instead, the failed foreign policy of the Obama administration, starting with Hillary Clinton and now John Kerry, is pressuring Israel to give up Jerusalem? Why? We should never divide the eternal capital of Israel, which is Jerusalem, and we should move the American embassy there. But instead, now the Obama administration is unfreezing the Iranian bank accounts, sending $7 billion to them on the hope of empty promises that maybe they'll stop their nuclear program. Let's defend Israel. The Jewish people are our friends. They have a right to security in their homeland. Visit PrayInJesusName.org. Again, that's PrayInJesusName.org and sign that petition right now. He is the intersection of church and state. Here is Dr. Chaps. Welcome back, I'm Dr. Chaps, joined again by my new friend, Derek Gilbert, who is the author of a book about Old Testament prophecy. And Derek, remind people the name of the book and where people can find that. The book is The Great Inception, Satan's PsyOps from Eden to Armageddon. Uh, you can get the book at uh, amazon.com or anywhere books are sold or from uh, the store that we have through our ministry, Skywatch TV, skywatchtvstore.com. And uh, tell actually, us about your TV show. What is Skywatch TV? It's a weekly interview program. We uh, take a look at uh, interesting scientific discoveries, uh, prophecy, the supernatural realm from a Christian perspective. We'll deal with everything from um, uh, the ancient uh, giants of the ancient world to uh, the UFO phenomenon. UFOs, are those in the Bible? Or talk about the lesser gods, because I went to see Wonder Woman this weekend, Marvel comic, or I'm sorry, DC comic superhero, and she, in the story, which we all know is fantasy, uh, is a child of a lesser god, one of those small G gods you were talking about, in this case, Zeus. But did the old Roman gods show up anywhere in the Old Testament or are they just fallen angels or are they demons or how would the Bible view that? There is an episode 
uh, that we don't get enough detail about in the Bible itself. That's the Tower of Babel incident, or at least we, we kind of allegorize it away as uh, this is a lesson for people getting too prideful or you know, uh, rising above their station, um, uh, when in fact, when you combine the, uh, the biblical account with documented history, tablets that have been, uh, inscriptions that have been found and, and translated over the last 150 years, you see that what was going on there was a Sumerian king Enmerkar, and I make the case for identifying the Sumerian king Enmerkar with Nimrod in, in the book, um, was trying to build a, um, the abode of the gods. He was trying to build up a temple to the uh, ancient Sumerian god Enki at Babel and uh, build it into the, the abode of the gods. Well, Enki just happened to be the god, the lord of the abyss. Uh, and the abode of the, uh, the the gods, building a false mountain, a false mount of assembly, which is a phrase you'll see repeated again and again in the Bible. Um, there is one true mount of assembly, and that belongs to God Most High, God the Father, Yahweh. Uh, but there are false mounts of assembly. We see it referenced in Isaiah 14, for example, Lucifer, how art thou fallen? Um, but uh, Nimrod attempted to build an artificial mount of assembly as the abode of the gods way back in uh, ancient Sumer, uh, not at Babylon, and I explain why in the book as well. Uh, the point of bringing that up is that uh, these gods, uh, after the uh, languages of the world were confused, uh, Yahweh essentially told humanity, if you don't want to deal with me, you'll deal with my subordinates. This is explained in Deuteronomy 32, verses 8 and 9, where Moses tells the Israelites that when God set the borders of the nations, when he divided the nations, he numbered them according to the number of the sons of God. And there is a tradition, not just among the Jews, but among the ancient world, the Canaanites in particular, the Egyptians also, that there were 70 sons of the Most High God in their pantheon. Uh, this is an example of the PSYOP, psychological operation, false information being fed to mankind by these small g gods in order to confuse them. So let me, them. let me pause you right there and ask, you, you referenced Isaiah 14 and it references Lucifer, the son of the morning star yes. and how he falls from right. heaven because of his pride. Uh, we as Christians understand that to be a reference to Satan being kicked yes. out of heaven. He was the worshiping angel Lucifer, now he is Satan the leader of the demonic uh, lesser G gods. The New Testament calls him the God of this world, the prince right. of the power of the air, uh, you know, and he's the one, the great deceiver, the one who fools people into rejecting the God of the Bible, into rejecting or even persecuting his son, Jesus Christ and the church. Uh, in, in the spiritual world, are there really other gods or are they just fake uh, gods that are pretending and, and they're actually demons? Well, we, some may be demons, and certainly they are fake gods in the sense that they do not have the same attributes as the capital G God. We English speakers attach a certain meaning to the word G-O-D that the ancients did not. And by the ancients, I mean the prophets and the apostles who wrote down the books of the Bible. Uh, it is essentially a designator of place as opposed to a, a, a rank or a title. Um, but we have made it into a title. Capital G God, we understand to mean Yahweh, the God of the Bible. Um, if you want to think of these uh, these lesser gods, the small g gods, as fallen angels or demons, that's fine. But the Bible calls them gods. In fact, in Psalm 82, God calls them gods. So I'm on pretty safe biblical territory here. Um, <laughs> and the point about Isaiah 14 is that uh, in condemning Lucifer, uh, he uh, in, in Isaiah 14:13, uh, Isaiah says, uh, quoting this this entity. You said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven above the stars of God, the sons of God, other angels, loyal angels. I will set my throne on high. I will sit on the mount of assembly in the far reaches of the north. Interestingly, in the Hebrew, far reaches of the north, sometimes translated into English as sides of the north or heights of the north, uh, is the Hebrew phrase, uh, Yerakat Zephon, Zephon, Mount Zephon, the holy mountain of Baal. This entity who was kicked out of heaven, Lucifer, wanted to establish his mount of assembly to rival Zion, God's mount of assembly, on Mount Zaphon, that mountain in the north, in, on the border between Turkey and Syria that I mentioned earlier. And so you're coming was, full circle. How is this different than the Nephilim? So we, in the Bible, we see Lucifer fell and there are fallen angels. Perhaps one third of the angels became demons. They're now wandering the earth, but that's not the same as what the Bible describes in, I think it's Genesis six, the Nephilim. 
Right. The Nephilim were the sons or the product of the uh, unholy union of sons of God, which were angels who chose to rebel, who, according to the extra-biblical book of Enoch, descended on Mount Hermon, which is the north end of the Golan Heights, 9,200 feet, uh, the tallest mountain in that part of the, uh, of the Near East. And they chose wives of all the daughters of men that they, that they thought were fair, and uh, the product of these unions were these giants, the men of renown, the Nephilim. Um, they, these Nephilim were in the beliefs of the, uh, the, the, the ancient uh, Jews, the Jews of the period le- up to and including the time of Jesus. In fact, the early church fathers up till about the 5th century, the time of Augustine, understood that this was where not only the giants came from, but they understood that these were the spirits of these giants, rather. The spirits of these giants were the origin of demons. So demons are not fallen angels. Demons are the spirits of these hybrid, unholy, angel-human uh, uh, chimeras who were condemned by God to wander the earth until the judgment and to afflict mankind. The ancient Greeks understood this as well, and I mentioned this in the book, The Great Inception. The uh, the Greek poet Hesiod, who wrote much of what we know today about Greek mythology, understood that daemons, demons, were the spirits of these men of the golden age, men of the age that was ruled by Kronos, the leader of the Titans. But the Greeks thought that these daemons were helpful spirits that were sent to guide and encourage and uplift humanity. Again, they got part of the story right, but because of the psyop, led by Satan and his minions, the ancient Greeks got it wrong. Interesting. We're going to take another short break. When we come back, we're going to talk about New Testament demonology as it may be influenced by the book of Enoch. Dr. Chaps will be right back with more PIJN News. Do you ever pray and sometimes you feel like your prayers are hitting the ceiling and they don't get to God or maybe you don't get the result that you hoped for? I'm Dr. Chaps and I want to make available to you a new resource, a four-part video Bible teaching series on how to pray effective prayers. Did you know God has given us instructions in the Bible? For example, in 1 Timothy 2, there are four different Greek words for four different kinds of prayers, supplication, petition, intercession, and thanksgiving. If you don't understand the way God teaches us to pray, then we cannot expect the result for which we hope. I'm asking you to get this important Bible video teaching series on DVD for a suggested donation of only $30. Call us right now at 866-Obey-God. Again, that's 866-O-B-E-Y-G-O-D. Or visit our website, PrayInJesusName.org and get this important video resource for your family. Call us right now. You know, people ask me, chaps, we're watching on this network. We've already set our DVR to record your shows, but our friends don't have this network or maybe they can't watch at this time. Did you know we are on demand on 10 different platforms? You can tell your friends to find this show, PIJN News, on their Roku box or their Amazon Fire box. Just look under the religion or news categories. Or maybe you have a smartphone or your friends or grandchildren can find us on Android TV, Google TV, Smart TV, or iTunes. Of course, we're always on the internet. Look for us on YouTube or Facebook or Twitter, or better yet, subscribe to our daily email alerts at PrayInJesusName.org. It's important that you share all of these available platforms with your friends so we can mobilize all of the body of Christ to pray the news and change the world. Would you join us? Visit PrayInJesusName.org to learn more. Stay tuned for the end of our show to learn how to partner with this ministry. Here's Dr. Chaps. Welcome back. I'm Dr. Chaps, joined again by Derek Gilbert. Derek, I believe in the canon of Scripture. The canon is closed. We're not trying to add new books to the Bible, and the book of Enoch is not in the Bible, and not in my King James Bible, but it is mentioned as part of the Apocrypha and extra canonical books, and it's actually quoted in the New Testament uh, is the book of Enoch in anybody's Bible, the, the Catholics or the Coptics? Tell me about that. Uh, in the Ethiopian Coptic Bible, they've considered it um, uh, inspired. It was familiar to the, uh, to the apostles, and as you mentioned, it was referenced by Jude in his epistle, 
Uh, Paul makes reference to the Genesis 6 incident in uh, 2 Peter 2, 4, where he talks about the angels who were who sinned and were thrust down to Tartarus, the Greek verb tartarao, which means thrust down to Tartarus. And of course, the only, uh, the, the uh, equivalent in, in Greek mythology would be those titans that I mentioned earlier, the uh, group of gods, the older gods led by Kronos, who were punished, but again, in the Greek cosmology, they get it wrong. They said it was Zeus, who Jesus identified with Satan in the Bible, uh, in the New Testament. Uh, the, the Greeks gave credit to Zeus for punishing the Titans by sending them down to Tartarus. Um, so Peter but, quotes Enoch, uh, not Paul, but Peter quotes Enoch and Jude quotes Enoch. What does Jude say? Uh, Jude talks about the angels who kept not their first estate uh, and, and very specifically identifies their sin as a sexual sin. Um, people who have a trouble accepting this idea from Genesis 6 that uh, the angels could produce children point to a uh, the, the, the Jesus when he said that uh, people uh, in the resurrection are like the angels in heaven, neither marrying nor giving in marriage. But these angels in Genesis 6 weren't in heaven. They left their first estate or their place, their proper dwelling, according to Jude, depending on the translation. And Jude specifically identifies the sin as being uh, like that of Sodom and Gomorrah, who chased after strange flesh. Uh, again, this was an unholy union. Angels and humans were never supposed to mate, and that's why the uh, spirits of their offspring, the Nephilim, were condemned to wander the earth. They were not allowed access to heaven. So fallen angels are not just cast out of heaven like Lucifer for, for his sin of pride, as mentioned in Isaiah 14, but you're saying right. fallen angels that we have among us today, the world of the demonic, are the product or the spiritual beings of these Nephilim that were, uh, they had flesh, but then they died and now they're wandering the earth as spirits. That's correct. The Nephilim who were the uh, demigods of old, Hercules, Wonder Woman you mentioned earlier, uh, uh, others uh, worshiped in the ancient world like Melkart, uh, who was the god of um, uh, Ahab and Jezebel in the Old Testament. And I explain why that's really interesting in the book, The Great Inception. Um, Yes, they were the, 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 the semi-divine progeny of these angels called Watchers who rebelled and descended on Mount Hermon. And Jesus did battle with the spirits of these Nephilim who still wandered the Holy Land in his day. Israel had been claimed by God. Canaan had been claimed by God for his people, the people of Israel. And the Bible, if you look at it with this mindset that this is a long war between these rebellious gods and their creator, to take his holy mountain, which is Zion, for their own. And you see these encroachments taking place all through the Old Testament. Finally, God says, okay, look, I'm going to give you over to the Babylonians, but there'll be a day when you, you'll come back. Then when Jesus arrives on the scene, much of his ministry is throwing these demons off. It, basically, what Jesus is doing is wandering, going around Israel, cleansing it by saying to these demons, get off my land. So Jesus cast out demons. He commanded the disciples in Matthew 10 to cast out demons, and he also commanded the 70. Although Peter and Jude mentioned the book of Enoch, or at least quote from it selectively, you think there's also a reference in Jesus' speech to the disciples when he came down the Mount of Transfiguration. Talk about that. Did he quote the book of Enoch? Well, he didn't quote the book of Enoch per se, but again, it's a reference to the incident that uh, Enoch uh, explains for us, which uh, again, was the reason Jesus went up Mount Hermon, which was the site of the Watchers' Rebellion, when they descended on the, the summit of Mount Hermon and swore an oath to one another to go through with this rebellion against God. Jesus ascended Mount Hermon for the transfiguration, which was like sending a flare into the spirit realm. Here I am, come and get some. And then of course he went down the mountain, and then the reference to the 70, which are the 70 sons of El, Mount Hermon supposed to be the Mount of Assembly, again, another rebellious mount of the congregation, for one of these false gods where El lived with his 70 sons, that's why Jesus sent out the 70, or 72 depending on the translation, but if you add uh, you know, Jesus and God the Father, you've got 72 as well. But the number is not random, it is not a coincidence, it was a specific message targeted at the spirit realm. You rebels, I'm here, what are you gonna do about it? And when Jesus sent out the 70, they came back to him, I think it's uh, Luke 11 or 12, and, and they yes. were shocked that they had power to cast out demons. And Jesus said, I saw Satan fall from heaven like lightning right. when you guys were casting out the demons. So the kingdom of God was advancing. He was yes. uh, teaching his disciples how to do spiritual warfare, how to cast out demons. 
and it's all based on that. Uh, this is exciting stuff, Derek. I'm, I'm actually impressed having not met you before today, uh, but this parallels a little bit some of the theology I talk about in my dissertation, which is how to see the Holy Spirit, angels, and demons. That's also available on Amazon through an academic yeah. press, WIF and Stock. And uh, you and I right. are brothers from another mother. We, we, we resonate on this spiritual warfare stuff. Yeah, it's, it's amazing. And then when you read Psalm 82 with this worldview in mind, uh, where God stands in the midst of the divine council, or the KJV says, the congregation of the mighty, and passes judgment on these rebellious gods and said, though you are gods, and all of you are children of the Most High, ye shall die like men and fall like any prince. God has passed judgment on them. A day is coming when God inherits all the nations. And Derek, the gods we, have just, will... we have just one minute left, but somebody's watching this and they're saying, wow, this is all fascinating, but how does it affect me? Would you lead us in prayer and how would you uh, advise someone watching this? Father, I just pray that uh, you grant us wisdom to understand that the enemy these rebellious small g gods uh, take this conflict, this supernatural war, very, very seriously. This affects our families, our friends, our colleagues, because these entities know that a day is coming when they will die like men. They want to take as many of us with them as possible. They take this conflict very seriously. Lord, we should likewise. Father, for those of us who do not yet know Jesus Christ, I pray your spirit will lead us to your saving knowledge the shed blood of Jesus Christ will save us for from the uh, the second death, the one that the enemy wants to condemn us to as well. Father, I just pray that uh, when the opportunity arises to communicate this truth to our friends, our family members, our colleagues, our children, our grandchildren, that you'll give us the words to speak. Father, you've put it all in your book for us. History supports and confirms the narrative of your word. I pray, Father, you'll open our eyes to the spiritual war taking place around us and help us to share the urgency of knowing and coming to Jesus Christ with all those who you bring into our path, or the divine appointments that you set for us each day. Amen. And I ask this in Jesus' name, amen. Amen, his website is derekpgilbert.com. Get his book on Amazon, we're out of time. You can visit our website, PrayInJesusName.org, or call us toll free if you need prayer, 866-Obey-God. God bless you, we'll see you next time. Today I wanna to invite you to sign an important petition to Congress to protect military chaplains, especially their right to pray publicly in Jesus' name. If you remember my story, you know that I was vindicated by Congress in 2006 after I took a principled stand for the right to pray in Jesus' name, but Congress never did pass a positive law to let chaplains pray according to their conscience. Would you sign that petition with me? Let's take action today. Dr. Chaps needs your financial support to stay on the air. Would you please send your best donation today? Please visit PrayInJesusName.org to donate online. Or you can mail a check to Pray In Jesus Name Ministries, Post Office Box 77077, Colorado Springs, Colorado 80970. You can also call us toll free right now at 866-Obey-God. That's 866-O-B-E-Y-G-O-D. Please sign up for our free emails at PrayInJesusName.org. Again, that's PrayInJesusName.org.